Good afternoon. Welcome to the second installment of the 2021 Farm Journal Foundation Speaker Series. My name is Trisha Beal. I'm CEO of Farm Journal Foundation. And on behalf of our entire team, thank you for joining us. I have been looking forward to the, today's panel since we started scoping it about six months ago, because the four people that you will meet on our panel today have so much to teach us all about how consumer perceptions in relation to food are evolving and how our personal experiences during the time of COVID-19 have accelerated this evolution. At Farm Journal Foundation, we talk about this evolution and measure it in terms of a personal food footprint. This includes the value that you place on the way food impacts the environment, society, and your personal health. We wanna extend a sincere thank you to our dozens of university and student organization partners who are with us today and who have supported us in this series, many of whom have taken this content into their curriculum. Thank you so much. We're so excited to have this partnership with you and to the hundreds of students who are joining us today. Thank you for taking time from a busy end of semester schedule to join us. We wish you well and luck as you enter your finals. And for those of you who are graduating, we extend a sincere congratulations to you. So I've been asked to share a few logistical points for today's session. First of all, this session is being recorded and will be available on Facebook Live and YouTube after the event. Also, um, there will be polling questions shared throughout. Please participate. And if you wanna ask a question, please use the chat feature. Now I am proud to introduce my colleague, Roger Thoreau, who will serve as our moderator for today's session. In addition to serving as a scholar in residence at Auburn's Hunger Solutions Institute, Roger has written three amazing books and had an incredible chapter in his career where he served as a foreign correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. So Roger, I'll pass it on to you now to introduce our keynote and our amazing panel. Hey, thank you very much, Tricia. Thanks for the introduction, for the plug of the books. That's the commercial interlude, so <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, and uh, yeah, very warm welcome and enthusiastic welcome. Uh, and a big thank you uh, to everybody out there who's joining us today for this next edition of our, 21, of our 2021 uh, speakers uh, series. And in particular, thanks to, as I said, to Tricia, Maddie, all your colleagues, uh, and to the Farm Journal Foundation, and to all the sponsors and partner universities and colleges and organizations for making this possible and gathering us all uh, together this afternoon. Uh, and as Tricia said, yeah, uh, 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 good luck, all the best to all the students there, particularly those that are in the midst of finals. So I'm coming to you from Auburn University. This is finals week. Uh, and so know the activity here and the concentration of the students. Uh, and so good luck and all the best to everybody uh, on that front. And particularly thanks for your interest in these issues. Uh, both global issues of whatever sort, but particularly the hunger, the malnutrition, the food insecurity issues and asking this supreme question, why does it continue to abide and persist in our world today? And what can we do to finally conquer and eliminate hunger and malnutrition? So our theme, our theme this year is building food systems that nourish the nexus of agriculture and nutrition. And it, 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 it's, it's really exciting because it's precisely at this nexus where, food, where we find our greatest challenge today so how do we both nourish the planet and preserve and protect the planet at the same time? How do we meet the, this relentless demand for more nutritious food coming from an ever increasing and ever more prosperous global population while also safeguarding our environment and our biodiversity? For the very act of growing food to feed us, to nourish us, takes a toll as we know on our soils, our waters, our air, our climate, all the animals, the pollinators, the habitats pushing us closer to our planetary limits. So success depends on all of us. We all have a role to play in meeting this challenge. We can all contribute mightily to this balance, to this battle, as I said, finally, finally, conquering hunger, malnutrition. No matter what we are studying, where our careers take us, uh, no matter our skill set or our passion, each and every one of us can make a vast and a big difference. So our topic today is, hey, it's complicated. The evolving relationship of consumers and food, complicated. Now there's an understatement that we'll hope to unwind and unravel and make less complicated as, as, as our time goes on here. 
So the role in our food, the, of food in our lives is evolving. Accelerated, as Tricia pointed out and noted, by the pandemic. Uh, people are deeply considering, more than ever before, we're finding that people are deeply considering the impact of food they consume, the impact on their personal health and the environment. And of course, COVID has just placed an exclamation point on all of this awareness. And through this panel, we'll be exploring emerging trends uh, in the evolution of the consumer of, of consumer relationship to food, including so personal food in, uh, footprints, the notion of food as medicine, and food justice. And what does all that mean? To take us through all this, we've assembled a, a, a fantastic cast of, of panelists who are now appearing on your screen. We have Tina Owens, who is Senior Director of Food and Agriculture Impact for Danone North America. Tina leads the charge to accelerate the return on investments with the incentives for farmers converting to regenerative agriculture, which involves sequestration of carbon, of carbon the addition of biodiversity, uh, focus on soil health and water conservation with the aim of, of, of creating a more stable supply chain with financial and climate resilience. Also joining us is Christine Doherty, the Vice President of Sustainable Agriculture and Responsible Sourcing and PepsiCo. Christine leads a team that works to sustainably source the more than 25 crops PepsiCo uses in its products. It's a vast task. This work spans 60 different countries and reaches more than 40,000 farmers. Christine also oversees a range of partnerships to advance the company's women empowerment agenda across its global agriculture supply chain, not only at PepsiCo, but in all the, the, the efforts beyond. Also here with us is Kevin Igley, who's the Senior Vice President and Chief Environmental Officer at Tyson Foods, which means he manages all aspects of Tyson's environmental efforts. This puts him squarely at this nexus that we've been talking about, this nexus of agriculture, nutrition, environment, and planetary health. Planetary health is growing movement that recognizes that every living thing on this planet, from the microorganisms in the soil to us human consumers of the food that comes from that soil, how we're all connected on this global food chain. But we'll begin our panel discussion in a, in, a, in a moment or two. But first, we'll begin with a keynote address by Mike Hughes, who is the head of research at Insight at FMCG Gurus, based in the UK. Mike has many years of experience analyzing consumer, consumer trends across the food, drink, and supplement industry, which indeed would make him a guru, I guess, right? Gurus in some sense and his great expertise. So Mike, as we'll hear, is particularly adept at challenging industry perceptions when it comes to assumptions around how consumers think and behave, as well as identifying new and evolving trends across markets. He can also provide a sharp analysis on the recent failed attempt to create a European Super League of leading football, soccer teams. But we'll leave that for another day. So Mike, you're our leadoff hitter, uh, so take it away. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Hi everybody, my name is Mike Hughes and I am Head of Research and Insights at FMCG Gurus. Um, this presentation is called It's Complicated, the Evolving Relationship of Consumers and Food. The presentation will last approximately 10 to 15 minutes. We'll look at the constant evolving role of sustainability within the food and drink industry. We'll look at how COVID has changed some of the perceptions towards sustainability and how brands need to focus on sustainability along the whole of the supply chain and be more transparent and proactive towards addressing the environment than ever before, whilst at the same time understanding how sustainability features need to be placed in context of other product attributes. This presentation will be available for download after the event, and if anyone would like any additional free resources from our website, there's a page there if it helps you with your current and future studies. So I think it's important first to examine how sustainability has changed over the last 40 years from an industry perspective. It's something that's continuously evolving and something that's becoming more and more important as consumers become more aware of a variety of different environmental issues and how more information is available than ever before. We know that before the 1980s, um, not that many companies focused on sustainability at the core of their philosophy. If a brand was positioned around sustainability credentials, they were somewhat of a niche brand. And an example of that in the UK is the body shop that started around the 1970s, the 1980s. And their focus was on how they won't be using parabands 
or testing on animals. And it was seen as a really radical concept because it was something niche, it was something differentiated. Then over the period 1980s to 2000, again, corporate and social responsibility was something that was, it was expected, but not overly influential. Again, you know, brands could differentiate based on their sustainability credentials in a way that they couldn't do now. And an example in the UK is Innocent Smoothies, and another is Green and Black Chocolate, whereby organic claims generally made the brand stand out. So again, we had a good 20, 30 year period in recent history where <clears throat> corporate and social responsibility was something of a niche. Uh, we then move forward to 2000 to 2020, where the focus on sustainability became collective and expressionist. Consumers expected brands to put corporate social responsibility at the core of their philosophy. And whilst they expected big brands to lead with addressing the environment, they also recognized that it was a collective effort and small steps that they could take was actually something that could um, make fundamental changes to the planet in the long term. So again, it became a very collective ex and expressionist issue. And focusing on addressing the environment was something that wasn't just a responsible, but it was something that well, was cool. And we saw the, the, the emergence of what we call ethical elitism. It was cool to be green. And then in 2020, COVID hit and everything changed in every industry. And what we'll see now is a renewed emphasis on corporate responsibility from big brands. Consumers recognize that the environment is at a tipping point. COVID-19 is something that's accelerated that and they'll be more focused than ever before on big brands addressing damage done to the planet before it's too late. So I think it's really important to recognize um, how sustainability continues to evolve. And that brings me to my next slide. And I think this is something that the industry can ask overall. And um, often when we see a trend around sustainability, it doesn't become mainstream right away. We have early adopters, the trend becomes more and more mainstream. It goes to different markets, it goes to different consumers, it becomes more accepted and it becomes a norm. And an example of this now is you look at research around plant meat and dairy alternatives, and 25% of consumers say that they're flexitarians. And I often read information that implies that the flexitarian trend is new, but actually it's not new at all. We only have to go back, you know, 20, 30 years. In 1995 in the UK, um, a meat analog brand called Quorn used Ryan Giggs, who was one of the most famous footballers in Europe at the time, to promote their alternative burger product. We know that the concept of the flexitarian started in 2003 with the Meatless Monday campaign in the US, but it took around 20 years for it to become fully mainstream and consumers of all ages and all backgrounds to say that they were flexitarian. So I think the big question is for 2020 onwards is what opportunities exist for brands as a result of COVID-19? And how can we take such terrible things that have happened over the last 12 months and turn them into the positives? We saw the Australian bushfires at the beginning of 2020, which echoed the importance of addressing climate change. And um, we also saw natural resources replanning themselves as a result of lockdowns, um, especially in the early half of last year. The example there is Venice, uh, where the canals were traditionally very dirty and within four or five weeks of lockdown, you could, you could see the marine life again. So, you know, what, what can brands take from this and turn a negative into a positive? You know, are there any new initiatives seen such as halting production on certain days or once a month, for example, to help natural resources replenish themselves? What's going to be the next fad that becomes a trend as a result of this? So firstly, consumers are concerned about the state of the environment and believe that damage done is irreversible. Uh, consumers say that they're concerned about the state of the environment. Uh, consumers say that they believe that the state of the environment has worsened considerably over the last two decades. And these attitudes tend to be higher in developing economies where they are exposed firsthand to changing ecological systems, mass globalization, mass industrialization, and sometimes a lack of, or historically at least, a lack of re regulation on acting in a responsible manner. As a result of this, somewhat negatively, many consumers believe that damage done to the environment is irreversible. At the same time, many consumers feel that the issue of the environment and health are interlinked and that damage done to the environment will impact the quality of life for both current and future generations. Uh, consumers have become more conscious about COVID-19, um, more conscious about the environment as a result of COVID-19. And as mentioned earlier, you know, COVID-19 has changed the way that we think about a lot of things. Uh, and the environment is one of these. Consumers have had time to step back and evaluate their lives in a way that's not been possible before because they've not been able to do as much. Um, and our research shows a high proportion of consumers have said that they become more attentive to sustainability claims 
as a result of COVID-19. And they'll continue to be more conscious about environmental issues after COVID-19 has passed. So this won't be a knee-jerk reaction. It'll be a fundamental change in the way that consumers think. And there's numerous reasons for that. Well, firstly, there's been greater focus than ever before on animal welfare initiatives. Um, consumers are also questioning whether the state of the environment was helped accelerate the spread of COVID-19, whether pollution and poor air quality was something that made the virus as deadly as it was. Um, at the same time, consumers feel optimistic, as, as mentioned, they saw natural resources begin to replenish themselves and thought, well, perhaps it's not too late for us to make a difference. And as a result of this, they'll expect brands to take a more proactive approach than ever before, whilst at the same time monitoring their own behaviour in a bid to try and save the planet. Uh, con consumers believe that brands and retailers should be doing more to protect the environment. Um, our research shows that a considerable proportion of consumers believe that brands and retailers should be doing more to protect the environment, with there being a year-on-year -year increase in the proportion of consumers saying this between 2019 and 2020. We know that many consumers believe that damage done to the environment, they see it to be the, see the reason as being corporate greed. Uh, brands focusing more on their stakeholders, on profit maximization, rather than the well-being of the planet. Um, unfortunately for brands, in areas of uncertainty in a recessionary environment, consum consumers tend to be even more scrutinizing of brands and practices and policies. If they're struggling with everyday finances, if life isn't going as well as it could be, they tend to look at big businesses and think, well, are these people profiting because they're acting in unethical behavior? And again, there's going to be more emphasis before on brands being proactive in addressing the environment, demonstrating transparency along the supply chain, and that also includes looking after the supply, monitoring the supply chains of suppliers to avoid any issues of greenwashing where brands are making claims about their sustainability practices only for their, them to be undone by some practices further along the supply chain that they may not be aware of. So again, it shows the real importance of brands being seen to take a proactive approach. Uh, consumers are also changing their dietary habits in order to lead a sustainable lifestyle. Again, we know one in two consumers over the last two years say that they've made changes to their diets in order to lead a more sustainable lifestyle. And again, this is a jump compared to 2019, just highlighting the effect that COVID-19 has had on consumer behavior in many ways. And now there's a number of ways in which consumers are making changes to their diets and lifestyles. We know that so much attention is being given to the growth of the plant-based markets and you know, absolutely consumers are turning to meat analog products, dairy alternatives, et cetera. But actually, one of the biggest things that consumers are doing are making greater attempts to reduce food waste. They see landfills piled up. They realize that this is damaging to the environment. They also actually realize it's damaging to their own pockets when they purchase products and then have to throw, throw them away because they're past their sell-by dates. Um, consumers are also turning to local food and drink more often. Um, it's showing that um, consumers want reduced supply chains. They associate such products with being healthier, better quality, safer, more trustworthy. It's worth noting that as well as environmental initiatives, consumers also actually want ethical initiatives. They want brands to demonstrate kindness, compassion, to understand where they are. So that also means looking after local farmers and ensuring that big, big brands are not seen to be exploiting these people, especially in a time of financial uncertainty. So it just shows that consumers are making a whole host of changes to their diets at the moment. And um, more inventive, environmentally friendly diets are associated with being healthier. We, we asked consumers if they noticed any other benefits from leading more sustainable lifestyles. And the most popular answer and a considerable increase year on year was environmentally friendly products are, are, diets are associated with being healthier. This is because environmentally friendly products tend to be associated with being natural and nutritious, real and authentic, local, healthier, et cetera. You know, there's, there's a real health halo that's um, associated with these products particularly because consumers associate sustainable practices with the absence of chemicals. Um, we know over the last 12 months, consumers have reevaluated their diets. They're also making attempts to eat and drink healthy. Uh, the reason for this is when the virus hit, consumers were scared, they were worried. They didn't actually know what was going on. They questioned their vulnerability to COVID-19. As the 12 months have passed, consumers have had time to reevaluate. And they thought, well, actually, even if I'm vaccinated against COVID-19, even if I'm lower at risk, Actually, my dietary habits have increased the risk of other long-term health problems such as cancer. And what should I do to protect this? So there's going to be a real focus on healthy eating in the long term. And sustainability will be seen as a core part of this with consumers wanting products that they deem green, clean and healthy. 
And at the same time, sustainability benefits need to be positioned around being beneficial for the environment and the individual. Um, it's important not to overestimate how altruistic consumers can be at times. Consumers recognize damage done to the environment. However, they can also be cost conscious. They can also be time scarce. They can also be driven by indulgence. And whilst they want to act in an environmentally friendly manner, they want to do so without compromise. So products need to be positioned as win-win for the consumer and the environment. Well, how can brands do that? Firstly, they can make the link between environmental practices and luxury. Um, as mentioned, the whole concept of ethical elitism. They can focus on sustainability and cost savings. For example, what savings from environmentally friendly practices can be pushed along the supply chains? For example, if there's reduced costs from reduced packaging, can they be pushed onto the end consumer? Health. Brands can make the direct link between how sustainable in practices can improve physical and mental well-being. And expression. Consumers want brands that match their attitudes and outlook, outlook on life, particularly younger consumers, particularly in an era of blogging and social media. Consumers want to express themselves to others and environmentally friendly practices and being seen to be green and clean is a key way of doing this. So luxury cost, health and expression is a key way of positioning environmentally friendly brands. So that concludes my presentation for today. As mentioned, this will be available for download um, and we will now um, be able to join the rest of the panel. Thank you very much for listening. Hey, thank you very much, Mike, uh, for that really fascinating presentation and those numbers, you know, and your, your polling numbers and things are really uh, extraordinary when you look at the jumps from 2019 to 2020 in, in, in consumer attitudes on a number of these things. Do you expect that this is going to uh, persist for for not only coming years, but for coming decades, or as the vaccine spread, as hopefully we get to this new normal, whatever that may be afterwards, that this is still going to be be preeminent in consumers' minds, or will there be kind of a backsliding on, on, on things once it's like, oh, so we've seen so many instances, particularly in, in, in agriculture, on nutrition efforts, where it's like, oh, hey, job well done. You pat yourself on the back. So people are thinking about this, and then it kind of goes and tails off. What, what, what are you thinking is the, the, the stability or the stickability of this? Yeah, thank you, Roger. It's a, it's, it's a great question, and I think it's one that it needs to be explored from a number of angles. Firstly, we, we look at trends that have occurred in 2019. And what's important is, whilst they've been accelerated by COVID-19, they weren't new trends. You know, uh, consumers were concerned about the environment in 2019. 2020 has allowed people to reshape um, and rethink about a lot of things. I mean, you know, there's been a high level of uncertainty, a high level of pessimism, and it's it's heightened consumers' emotions. Um, now, there will be some consumers who continue to worry about COVID-19. Um, our research shows around half of all consumers expect a third wave or even a fourth wave in some countries. There's 19% um, of consumers who think that the virus will continue to impact on daily lives for several years. For, for some, they, they're conscious that there's no end in sight, even with vaccinations being rolled out. Um, so those consumers will definitely continue to be pessimistic. Um, but actually, what I think will happen is um, a lot of these trends uh, will continue even when the pandemic passes, at least for a couple of years. Um, I think consumers have been able to step back from life in a way that they've not done before. They've been able to reevaluate what's important to them. Uh, there's been a greater focus on non-material wealth, so things such as health and your living conditions and your environment. Uh, consumers have had a look around us, and actually they said, you know what, um, sometimes when we've been so busy doing things, we've not looked at the wider picture, and this has given us a chance to think of some, of, of, of um, think about different things. Um, so I think there'll be a greater emphasis on brands to be proactive because consumers will want to see this, you know, um, you know, many consumers may be thinking as well, you know, well, OK, even after COVID passes, is this once in a lifetime generation virus or will we see more airborne viruses because of the nature of 21st century living? Um, consumers will also be more conscious about their health. And we know that over the last 12 months, um, focus on health has moved away from being aspirational and appearance based to a focus on disease ma management and minimizing that vulnerability to illness and the environment plays an absolute key role in that. So. So, yeah, so I actually think this will fundamentally change the way that consumers think. You know, we, we monitored consumer trends over April to February. Um, and what we saw was actually that some of these issues, while some of the figures may have jumped a bit, um, they will come down slightly. That's, that's, that's inevitable. Um, actually, they weren't knee-jerk short-term reactions and 
you know, once the food service sector opens, once the economy bounces back, everyone will forget about it. Um, actually, you'll see you you will see a fundamental change in consumer behaviour, and I think I think especially now amongst younger people, they'll they'll drive that. You know, uh, we know younger people are more aware than the environment than than ever before. You know, we you only have to look in Europe, for example. Um, it's very much the Generation Z, the millennial market, that are driving the the the, the demand for change. The next generation of consumers, the Generation Alpha. Um, they'll be exposed to more information than ever before. They'll be exposed to more adverse weather conditions. They'll be questioning whether issues such as um, COVID-19 was spread as a result of damage done to the environment. So, so yeah, I, d- I do actually believe in the long term, we'll see the next the next level when it comes to um, sustainable practice and the importance of that. Good, excellent. No, it'll be, it'll be fascinating to watch this uh, coming up. And that's a great uh, transition because I know that the, uh, the rest of our panelists are also keenly att- attuned to this because they're all involved in some of the most prominent, uh, you know, uh, uh, brand uh, names uh, uh, in our world today. Uh, and so let's start with uh, Tina, the known uh, North America. I mean, so how does this all resonate with you in terms of what kind of consumer demands are particularly high on your radar? How is your portfolio, uh, product portfolio, evolving to, to, to meet these demands? And kind of, are you kind of in sync or seeing the same thing as, as Michael's talking about? Yeah, Roger, thanks for the question. And also want to thank you and Tricia and the broader Farm Journal Foundation team for the ability to speak on these topics today. Um, We have several uh, household name brands that saw an increase in demand as a result of COVID and lockdown and pantry stocking. So a couple notable examples, one would be Horizon Organic Milk, which is the single largest milk brand in the U.S. And also uh, Silk and So Delicious, which are plant-based brands. Um, you know, all of which saw double digit uh, level demand during pantry stocking and growth. And what is really important and what I think, uh, Roger, both you and Mike have called out well, is now consumers have this visceral understanding of how what we do to the environment can end up impacting our daily lives on a broad scale. And it's one of the reasons that we've taken steps with brands like Horizon Organic to publicly commit to being, you know, a carbon neutral milk brand by 2025, because consumers are looking even more than they were before the pandemic to play activist with their their grocery dollars. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons that Silk has uh, just announced a, a Be Better program that is actually helping uh, pollinators in, in almond orchards. You know, it's, it's really important that consumers are seeing a link um, that the brands are making so that they feel confident that the food system that they trust, that they know, that they want in their daily lives is providing the value Um, back in agriculture that we know needs to happen as a result of this new awareness and awakening of just how fully linked we are. And, you know, Danone's mission is to bring health through food to as many people as possible. That's under the umbrella of One Planet, One Health, uh, which is our our strategy globally. So, you know, we see these as very much interconnected ideas and um, looking to help consumers make choices that are aligned with the, the values that have been reinforced as part of COVID. Yeah, that's also so really interesting. And I think also for from from like your point of view and the company's point of view, that a lot of these things are also so crucial for your supply chains. I mean, you mentioned the pollinators and the bees. I mean, I think it's like one out of every three bites of food that we take is thanks to a pollinator of some nature. So the disappearing and collapsing pollinator communities also has to be of like really great concern for you in addition to the farmers that you're working with. And so, so can you talk a little bit about how some, how, how your farmers, you said how all this then brings back to agriculture and then obviously to the farmers, mm-hmm. fishers, ranchers, the ones that are, are, are then producing uh, the food. Uh, can you talk about some of what their responses have been and uh, kind of how you're able to, uh, uh, you know, guide that uh, and, and some of their regenerative agriculture practices or technologies that they may be using? Yeah, I'll give two specific examples that we're doing as a company. First, in 2018, we announced a $6 million investment into regenerative agriculture conversion. So we're paying for technical assistance at the farms. So the farmers can understand what the baseline of their practices are. And then my role is to help open really big doors on financing the transition to regenerative agriculture soil-centric practices, um, like crop rotation, cover crops, no-till, and animal integration where possible. Um, and the second example I'll list is we've got one uh, uh, OP2B, which is the One Planet Business for Biodiversity uh, Consortium that we actually founded 
and then invited, uh, you know, 20 plus companies into where we're looking to use our size and scale and activism as a major CPG to bring other big food companies along on this understanding of just how critically biodiversity is actually tied to our entire ecosystem. And more than 75% of our foods come from less than 12 crops on, on the planet. And so biodiversity is about more than pollinators. It's also about how many different plants we have within our food system and what they provide to us in the way of nutrition and how we actually uphold that whole system in a way that values both the biodiversity, uh, you know, the life within our, our soil and, and the life of our farmers, but also, um, you know, us as consumers. I'll turn it back to you because I know we've got some great examples on the rest of the panel to get to as well. Right. Well, thanks, uh, Tina. And thanks for generously throwing it back because I was just, just going to say, let's go next to uh, uh, Christine. Uh, and so you made some announcement re announcements uh, recently um, on this front. If you could explain some of them, like including like what are some of PepsiCo's top environmental uh, goals and how your product portfolio and all these crop sourcing uh, uh, practices and things that you're involved with uh, how are these evolving uh, as well? Right. Well, thank you, Roger. And uh, thank you, everyone on the Farm Journal team. And I'm super excited to be here personally. And it really gives me optimism to see many of you that are interested in a career in agriculture. Um, because through my career and ultimately the places I've been and the people I've seen, it's quite a fulfilling career and super excited that, that you all are interested in it. And so let me just give you a brief overview of PepsiCo. Some of you may think, really? Pepsi? Blue can Pepsi? What do you know about agriculture? Huh. Um, but, well, I was you know, going to raise that. So. <laughs> exactly. You know, PepsiCo really, we're an agricultural company at our core. We source over 200 ingredients in over 60 countries. Think about some of the brands that are born in the soil. Quaker oats, fruits and vegetables for Naked and Tropicana, chickpeas for Sabra, and clearly, you know, our flagship potatoes for Lay's. And those that don't start in the soil, we're working to reduce plastics, such as our SodaStream brand. So as you can tell, we are a very large company and we have a lot of touches with the agricultural supply chain around the world. So given our scale and our reach, we have a responsibility and an opportunity to help build a more regenerative, sustainable, and inclusive food system. So Roger, let me just briefly touch on what we announced um, last week. We call it their PepsiCo's positive agricultural ambition. And essentially what we're going to do is source our crops and ingredients in a way that accelerates regenerative agriculture and strengthens farming communities. We have three main pillars. One, we're going to help spread the adoption of regenerative farming practices across 7 million acres, which is about equal to our agricultural footprint. We are going to work on improving the livelihoods of more than 250,000 people in our agricultural supply chain. And that includes economically empowering women and minorities. And then finally, how do we make sure that we're sourcing 100% of our key ingredients? Because the consumer ultimately wants to know, where did my product come from? How are you treating the environment? what's happening with the farmer. So these are areas that PepsiCo is really gonna lean into. And you heard Tina and you heard Michael talk about soil health is absolutely critical. That's one of the areas that we're gonna be measuring outcome. Clearly sequestering carbon, reducing emissions, absolutely critical. Watershed health, we heard Tina talk about that. That's clearly somewhere where we need to look holistically, enhancing biodiversity and farmer livelihood. So I'll pause there, turn it back to Roger, because I know we've got a couple other folks on the panel to speak as well. Thank you, Christine. Hey, just one uh, quick follow-up. So can you define a little bit or, or maybe an example or two of what regenerative agriculture uh, you're talking about and some of the things maybe that some of the farmers uh, that you're working with have then put into play? 
Yeah, so it's really interesting. Regenerative agriculture really means to regenerate the soil. And I would say that there's not a a final definition that you can, you know, look up and say, wow, this means X. But there are practices that the farmer um, can implement. So for example, soil health is clearly um, a criteria. How do you bolster that soil? Could be using cover crops, could be reduced tillage. How do you reduce the amount of fertilizer that's needed? And so for us, the regeneration of that um, soil will absolutely lead to more uh, sustainable practices, carbon sequestration, and overall uh, farmer livelihood. So that's how we're defining it. And also, are you seeing that on some of these practices, the farmers themselves are leading the way and, are, and, and, are, and you're seeing, oh, they're doing this or they're putting it into play. That is a practice that we, we want to support and, and subscribe to and kind of make a standard practice. Absolutely. The farming, com the farming community um, are amazing. And what, what you're seeing is more and more farmers are maybe dusting off some of the technology that their grandfather or their great grandfather had used in the past. I think a great example is cover crops and reduced stillage. I grew up in Iowa. And when I grew up, what was considered good farming was completely barren ground, manicured, there was nothing on top of it. And so that was considered, you knew what you were doing when you, you know, grew your crop, harvest it, and then that soil was, you know, tilled under. Now we're seeing, keep that soil covered, use some kind of a cover crop, maybe minimize tillage. And so it's a different mindset. And, and the I'm gonna say the progressive farmers, some farmers that are willing to try um, have been really the champions. And so that we call it peer to peer, farmer to farmer learning. How can we embrace that? That's what PepsiCo wants to encourage and we'll support those farmers in a way that uh, embraces those regenerative techniques. Good. Thank you for all those explanations and, and, and kind of the storytelling that we're also looking forward to. What are people doing? What, what, what can our audience and, and listeners kind of imagine and see uh, of, of what's going on? Uh, so, Kevin, um, you're also at the forefront and the nexus of all of this. Can you, can you tell us some about uh, Tyson's environmental efforts and, and kind of how they're valued by, by the company, by, by consumers? Uh, you know, by, by markets. Uh, so kind of what you're seeing on your front. Thanks, Roger. And thank all the panelists. This is a lot of fun hearing about everyone's stories and learning new things today. You know, I like to start with a lot of people think of Tyson, they think we're a chicken company. <laughs> and, and while that's true, we do a lot of other things. And so we also produce beef and pork products. We have a very broad portfolio um, there's a lot of brands you may be familiar with, like Jimmy Dean and Hillshire, Ballpark, Adele's. Um, and actually, by our own estimation, about one in five protein servings in the U.S., one in five comes out of a Tyson facility. So we have a lot of responsibility, and I'm going to talk briefly about that responsibility. Um, when I think about our farmers, I'll start there. We we rely on over 10,000 independent farmers and ranchers across the country who they actually raise the animals we depend on to run our business. They also grow the grain uh, to feed those animals. So I'll jump from there to greenhouse gases because as we look at our own greenhouse gas footprint, actually the big part of our footprints in the supply chain. It's not, it's not in the brick and mortar in the facilities that we operate. And in 2018, we worked with the World Resources Institute and we went to the Science-Based Targets Initiative. And we actually set a 30% GHG reduction target uh, for 2030 across all three scopes. And it's an absolute target for scopes one and two and its intensity for scope three. But just in that short period of time since 2018, things have changed so much. We've grown as a company, we've acquired additional businesses 
And so in 2023, we're going to have to update our uh, greenhouse gas profile already. We're going to have to redo our baseline and uh, have to take a fresh look at our targets. And so that's just the way this process works. You have to stay on top of it all the time. So in addition, uh, we were the, actually the first U.S. protein company to get a target like that approved by SBTI. Others have now done that as well, and we're glad for that. A um, couple other things, just real quickly. So we don't just think about water, or excuse me, uh, GHGs when we think about uh, our business and the environment. We think a lot about water, and water is my own personal passion. I spend a lot of time on it. We spend a ton of time on GHGs as well. But when we started looking at water, we put together a target that uh, ran through the end of 2020, an intensity target at 12%. We didn't get all the way to 12%. We got to close to eight. But for us, that was a big, big uh, improvement. And so we were really happy for that on an intensity basis. But we did something else. We started doing a new process called contextual water targets, again, working with the World Resources Institute. And the contextual water target is kind of this big, uh, weird term. And people are like, what does that mean? Well, it's really pretty simple. It means that when you set a target, it's for the entire catchment or the entire watershed uh, that your, your facility resides in. So our first one was in Western Kansas in an area town called Holcomb. Um, it sits atop the Agalala Aquifer, which is a very important drinking water aquifer in the US. And uh, we're one of the largest uh, water users in the state of Kansas. So we started there uh, and we completed our first uh, contextual water target. It's actually in the process of being certified by the Alliance for Water Stewardship currently. Uh, and then since then, we've identified 11 geographies and that list will grow but 11 initial geographies where we're setting these contextual water targets. And we just started our fifth one. Uh, and uh, we're pretty excited about that work. It's new. Not a lot of people are doing the contextual water target work yet. And you'll see it begin to trend toward become science, but it'll become science-based eventually. Um, it's not that it's absent science now, but to be science-based, there's different hurdles that the NGOs want to go through to, to get it to that point. And then finally, I'll talk briefly about land stewardship. Uh, we, made a, we made a 2 million acre target back in 08 to have an impact on environmental outcomes from row crop corn. We've got about, last year we got about 420,000 acres signed up. And then we had this little thing come along called a pandemic. And that has certainly slowed us down, but we're not stopping, we're continuing to work on that. We made an additional target of 5 million acres uh, related to grazing lands, and we're working uh, with a with a program called uh, Beef Care, and we also are working with the Nature Conservancy, and they did some review on that beef care process. So that's just a kind of a quick flyover, but we're doing a lot of exciting things. We do get a lot of questions, a lot of business to business questions about environment, people wanting to know how we're doing things, why we're doing it, and I think consumers care about the environment. I don't think you hear from consumers nearly as much as you do from other businesses. Yeah, hey, and so on that point, Kevin, and, and as Christine was talking about, you know, kind of the, the practices that, the, that a lot of the farmers they're working with are already adapting and putting into place because they see this. So farmers themselves are obviously hearing from consumers and they're seeing all this about, you know, their footprint, the, the, the greenhouse gas emissions, the, you know, the, the deforestation, their impact on the environment. Uh, how, how much are you, you know, also seeing and reacting to or, 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 or in concert with things that the farmers themselves are, are doing or may in fact be leading on uh, in some of these. So kind of them recognizing their responsibility and stewardship themselves and, oh yeah, here's who we're, we're supplying and, and here's our, our supply chain. Uh, so how much of that is also then being driven by the farmers? Oop, you're on mute. You're, I think you're on mute. I haven't been told that yet today. So yes, <laughs> it's a daily statement. You're on mute. I yeah, apologize. I get it all the time too. So even after all these months, it's like, geez. Yeah. I, well, I always try to make sure I mute myself too. So I did, at least I did that right. Um, we have had an opportunity, uh, obviously not as much during COVID, but prior to COVID 
um, I got to sit through some sessions with farmers who actually are really leaders in this whole space called regenerative agriculture. And, uh, you know, Chris pointed out that it's not perfectly defined yet, but we saw presentations where corn farmers, for instance, in the Delta in Arkansas, were doing some amazing things where they actually could uh, lease their tractors to other farmers for use because they were saving fuel and not running their tractors because of how much they were using cover crops and doing new things. Fascinating. And there's been a tremendous amount of work done uh, with respect to the topic of, of pulling carbon into the soil. Another interesting area because um, not everyone agrees on it, but farmers are a big part of the solution going forward. And carbon sequestration has to be right in front of us. And there's another interesting topic that keeps coming up and it's this word resilience. So it's kind of interesting that, that and for the students that they should, they should definitely do a little Google time on this. Look up regenerative ag, look up regenerative farming, look up the term resilience. You'll find a, you'll find a whole evening of fun. Um, so what, what I've been trying to say personally about resilience is, so we're doing these water targets I talked about, contextual water targets. Well, what resilience is about is when we do all that and we go out and we engage the whole catchment, all the people in the catchment, everyone who is impacted by the use of water, everyone who's impacted by a water risk, what resilience is talking about is, well, what if we're doing all these good things and a huge drought hits? How resilient is the process we put in place? That's what resilience is about. It's about not only what are you doing, but how will it combat the storms and the headwinds it's going to face going forward? And it's a, it's a fascinating area. There's some relatively fresh papers out there. People can read about resilience. Um, World Wild, the uh, World Wildlife Fund US did a paper back in the fall. That's a good one to look at. Um, anyway, it's a fascinating area. Yeah, and there's a lot of, as you mentioned, you know, uh, some of the conservation uh, organizations. Uh, it's fascinating some of these partnerships that are done, that are developing between yes. people that used to be in organizations that used to be in a fairly hostile uh, relationship, say farmers, ag side, and, and the conservationist and, and environmentalist. And now I think they're realizing that, hey, to achieve each of our goals, uh, you know, there needs to be, uh, uh, yeah, talking about what's the common ground here? What, what you know, this, 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 the hostility, you know, kind of a more of a coming together. If I go back five years and I'll stop with this, but, you know, and I roll forward, all of a sudden we have work streams going on with people like the Environmental Defense Fund, the Nature Conservancy, World Wildlife Fund US and others. And uh, it's great. And they're wonderful partners. The world has changed. Everyone has figured out that if we work together and we put science first, we'll get a lot done. It's really an amazing thing because it doesn't take very long in a room full of folks to find alignment. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, this is a, a great discussion. So we're already seeing some questions from the audience uh, and we'll get to them in just a second. But I wanted to kind of come back to something Mike had said and anybody can chime in on this. Uh, Mike, you were talking about, yeah, the, the, the investment in this, uh, the concentration uh, and the priority that particularly the younger generation and younger consumers are, are putting on this and, and driving a lot of this, this new demand. We saw this acceleration under COVID. I was just wondering kind of the various social media venues and things and kind of the widening of that and the widening of discussion on this, how that's also accelerating uh, all of this, all of these demands uh, as well. And in a sense, putting almost, uh, you know, in some instances, and particularly with some of your, some of the brands uh, that we've been talking about, almost kind of countervailing uh, concerns, I guess, or, or discussions. I mean, Christine mentioned, yeah, the, the, the big blue uh, Pepsi can. Uh, you know, uh, Kevin and, you know, the protein uh, and the whole discussion of, well, what's the role of meat in a, in, in, in a, in a healthy, in a diet for a healthy planet? Uh, so Mike, how does one, how, how does all, you know, all the discussion and everything that is then generated by, by social media uh, 
kind of also uh, accelerating or impacting all of this? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Social media has changed the the game in a, in, in a number of ways. And, you know, we, we traditionally looked at a business and was like, well, the only kind of interaction we have with a business is when we purchase the products off the shelves. Uh, you know, now consumers believe that they can, well, they can interact, they can engage with brands. They can actually fundamentally change the way that brands operate. They can highlight yeah. issues and bring them to their attention. So it brings a new level of responsiveness. responsiveness. Um, and that's something that's really um, something that um, is a positive because sometimes people can have misconceptions around brands. They can associate big brands with being, you know, not being environmentally friendly as both Christine and Kevin have alluded to. And, and actually that's, that's not true at all. You know, uh, being a big brand and being environmentally friendly don't have to be mutually exclusive. You can demonstrate your credentials along the, the whole of the supply chain. And things like social media is a key way of showing that and allowing people to know firsthand what's going on to have that interaction, to see that brands are doing things such as offsetting carbon footprints, replenishing natural resources, you know, leading these issues, they can quantify the changes that are being done. And it's something that's really, really good for helping consumers, you know, sometimes have some of the misconceptions with brands. And at the same time, it also means that brands have to be more proactive and responsive and on the ball than ever before. Because, you know, we, we live in an era of, uh, you know, it's, it's a phrase that's become more and more established, but fake news. And, you know, it's actually a challenge that brands face now where somebody could make a comment about a brand's environmentally friendly issue, practices that is actually inaccurate. But by the time the brand have rectified the issue, it's been spread to millions and millions of people in a matter of seconds. And those, those misconceptions, you know, remain with the people, you know. And um, that's why, you know, it's a really unfair challenge for brands. Additionally... Um, you know, they can also be um, subject to campaigns. Uh, there was a very famous example in, um, I think it was 2011, and I won't name the fast food brand, but they were promoting how ethical their sustainable packaging was, um, only for them to be hit with um, a backlash from Greenpeace. And the reason for that was, unbeknownst to the fast food company, um, materials being used from the packaging was from um, a sacred Indonesian rainforest. Um, you know, the, the, the brand was aware of this, but they got hit with a ba massive backlash. So it shows the importance of being proactive. Um, it shows the importance of being responsive. It shows the importance of monitoring the whole of the supply chain to uh, quell any bad news or fake news uh, should that arise. But then on the same time, there's a lot of advantages where you can interact, you can engage with the consumer, you can challenge misconceptions about big brands, and you can also work together collectively where, you know, if this is an issue that's really strong for consumers, they feel really passionate about this. Actually, I can interact with my um, with my client base and I can make changes. And I think that's I think that's a really positive thing going forward. And, you know, um, I mentioned it earlier, that will only change again with, you know, Generation Alpha. You know, we, we, we have, you know, kids now who are four or five years old who are so technologically savvy. Uh, and that will just transpire to the next generation, you know, and they will they will expect this interaction. Yeah, thanks, Mike. You covered so many things that I ho was hoping that you would uh, touch on. So, Christine, Tina, uh, Kevin, kind of any thoughts from you on how you're kind of navigating uh, this that Mike was just uh, talking about? That okay, there's all these the, 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 the announcements and the, the things and the new products and the environmental friendly and sustainable aspects too, and and with regenerative agriculture, you know. But then there'll be kind of also maybe a, an a countervailing. Uh, you know, campaign that says, uh, yeah, well, what about the, the, the soft drink industry? What about uh, in terms of planet, you know, healthy diets and, and this diet for a healthy planet and the proteins and the meats? We just saw that flare up again uh, with, with allegations uh, that were going around uh, uh, in, in one sector that, gee, the Biden administration is going to limit us to like four, four, you know, a hamburger a month or some, <laughs> something uh, or whatever that was. And they then quickly said, what? No. Ah, no, we never. Where's that coming from? So, kind of, how do you navigate your way through through all of that? So, uh, Christine, if you want to start, and then Tina, Kevin, any thoughts? Sure, thanks. Yeah, I, I think a couple of things. And so, um, if we if we look at popsico and you know plastics, plastics are a huge problem. Nobody wants to see their brand in a water stream or on a beach or or other things. So. You know what? What we do? Well, we we certainly need 
to have more people recycle. We want to use our pet. We want to work on, you know, biodegradable. At the same time, we have a business model to actually reduce the consumer's use on plastics through soda stream. That, that's one of those where we're saying, hey, consumer, we realize that this is an issue. And so if you can enjoy your favorite beverage at your home and it reduces the plastics or the single use, absolutely. And the other thing I want to build on what Kevin said is that we know as multinationals, We've got to be in the same geography, working on the same problem as our competitors, as our peers, as our colleagues, and also, as I like to say, our critical friends. And so this is where we need to all just sit down at the table and co-create solutions that are actually going to make a difference. I heard some people talking about um, outcomes and impacts. This is where we're leaning in. We can measure all day long and we need to measure, absolutely. But at the end of the day, what is the outcome or the impact from the action or practice that took place? And if we're showing reduction in carbon, better watershed, rural communities are thriving, that's what we're leaning into. Tina? Yeah, and then just building on what um, Christine just shared, uh, you know, consumers are expecting a level of transparency now from brands, especially brands they do business with all the time, that if you're not proactively providing that information, um, you, you actually have a reputational risk. And so, you know, I mentioned earlier Horizon Organic commitment to be carbon neutral, which we're, uh, we're actually calling carbon positive by 2025. And, um, and it's because we're looking at to have a positive impact on the farm, on um, the consumer and on the environment and beyond. We actually just published the life cycle and, uh, analysis for our entire milk footprint under Horizon Organic for um, a half gallon of, of milk, which is our uh, most uh, widely sold product. And so you can go out now and see where the carbon footprint is within the milk, how much we have in total carbon footprint versus the national average, and what reduction levers we're doing and, and how we're creating partnerships with the 600 plus farmers, family farmers that we direct contract with for our Horizon Organic milk. It's important to proactively create transparency, but also more important to have third party validation. So on our regenerative agriculture program, we have um, uh, Eco Practices, which is an outside entity that does not sell inputs, but provides that technical assistance for the farm. It's validating what's happening on the farm. The farmers maintain ownership of their data. They get to decide what gets passed through to us. But if there are, um, people who are interested in seeing what kind of reports are able to be created at this point in time, I encourage you to go to McCarty Family Farms, which is one of our largest uh, family farm partnerships, and go to their environmental tab and look at all the reports they have since I think it's 2016 or 2017 about all the actions they've taken on farm and how they're measuring their footprint. Because again, third party validation, transparency, openly communicating these things on an ongoing basis, showing year to year uh, improvement, and validation by those partners is, is uh, very important. And I'll add one final thing, EDF, uh, we mentioned, uh, Kevin mentioned the nonprofit. EDF just uh, helped us co-launch an activist campaign with Horizon just in the last few days for Earth Day, where you can actually um, you know, call on policymakers to take a look at carbon footprint of our foods and policy that helps with climate change mitigation. So there's this advocacy aspect of it that's outside of the purchase of products that brands can still play that role in catalyzing how we all come to the table, you know, to Christine's point of how we all actually need to start working together to make sure this really big change takes off. Thank you. EDF is Environmental Defense Fund, right? Yep. Yes, it is. Thank you, Roger. Kevin, any thoughts? You know, just to follow up on what Tina was saying, um, it's all about transparency. It's all about third party validation. It's about telling your story. And one of the most difficult things for anyone making food, regardless of the kind of food, is how do you back up your claims? And so you have to have that, that you have to have the courage to tell your story, but you also have to get out there and do it. And so, for instance, we've been watching some interesting dynamics with the dairy industry. They've been doing a great job at figuring out 
where they're going to go with greenhouse gases. And the same with the beef industry. Um, everyone wants to talk about methane and how methane is formed with cattle. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's formed uh, as part of when, when cattle eat, it's part of the digestive process. But there's a lot of research going on right now about feed additives and how, how the beef industry could over time have a huge impact on greenhouse gases, particularly methane, um, through feed additives. It's not settled science yet, it's very complicated, but the fact that it's being worked on and the significant level of work that's going on at multitude of universities tells you that it's happening, it's real. And so I think more of the story needs to be told is what I tend to wanna push with people is we've gotta tell our story um, and it's it's not it's not you know one animal type versus another that that's that's not helpful. It's it's more helpful to tell the story for everything. Then everybody can make their own choices and do what they need to do um, to get comfortable with the science and what's really going on. Thank you, Kevin. Well, as a sure. journalist, I can fully subscribe to uh, yes the the call and the imperative to for the the telling the story. Uh, you know, better and as much from the human point of view um, and, you know, kind of to capture people's imagination as much as possible. So that's right. And that gets back to kind of for all the students and basically anybody listening, again, that no matter what your skill set is or what, what you're studying or what your passion is, you know, you can bring something to this uh, uh, issue. So it's not just for, for kind of the ag people or the development people or the economists. But it's kind of anybody. I mean, whatever you're doing, even in in in, in liberal arts, anything you're studying, uh, can apply to this. Hey, so we're getting some really good questions from um, uh, uh, the, the virtual realm uh, that are coming in. One just got covered up by the poll. I'm taking. So Sarah from Iowa State asks, what sources do consumers look for as ways to support developing their own food fit footprint? Uh, or food as uh, medicine perspective, which goes to also a question that somebody applied while they were registering as, as questions can be uh, done or put forth at that time. They had asked, so what do I look for as proof, kind of as, as Kevin was talking about, you know, uh, as proof that a product is healthy and environmentally sustainable. So are there new, are there new tools uh, that are developing? I know some of you are really active in uh, you know, kind of tracking uh, the sustainability of products or, 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 or the, 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 the sources of where they're coming from uh, to prove that, a lot opening up on the artificial intelligence uh, realm. So beyond that kind of side panel on a product that says, here's what's here and, you know, here's our claims, um, what can people be, be looking for as they try to shape uh, their own uh, environment, their own personal environmental footprint? So whoever wants to you know, jump in here. Again, Christine, you're nodding your head. Tina too. So Tina. Yeah, I would just um, uh, say, you know, look look at those companies that actually have um, science based goals um, and work with credible science based um, entities. Uh, that that's going to be the foundation um, of some of the claims. You know, we've all uh, heard about um, the science-based targets, the climate claim. They're coming out with water and biodiversity, and so that that's the first thing I do is to make sure that they are partnering with a credible entity um, on the on the science-based. And I'll turn it to my fellow panelists. Thank you, Christine. Yeah, so um, I totally agree. Uh, we're part of the science-based target initiatives as well, and it does matter that you're uh, rolling up to some sort of third-party validation. Um, what's really interesting is consumers can passively get this information now. So if they're just following brands on Facebook, they get it showing up in their feed. You no longer have to go out to a website to make this information show up. And the opposite is true as well. If there's something negative about your brand, it shows up automatically in a feed if it's a company that you've expressed an interest in. And so, um, you know, I think consumers aren't necessarily having to go out to websites and do research like they did in the past. Um, you know, there are, uh, there is work that we're doing within Danone. Uh, Activia is one of our, our large yogurt brands. They're working on how the microbiome and uh, COVID are linked because uh, it's one of the, you know, um, brands that has led the conversation with consumers about gut health for at least a decade. 
it's important for us to know what that health connection is between our food and, and as I mentioned earlier, our mission of bringing health through food to as many people as possible. And then Roger, I'm gonna soapbox here for a moment on the technology that you and I have talked about a little bit, which is the molecular mapping of food and um, how the genome of food is being mapped now. And, and uh, Danone has announced a partnership with Brightseed where we're, uh, we've commissioned the uh, soy genome to be mapped. And I know Pepsi has done similar work on oats. And so there's a whole new revolution that's coming in food information as it relates to health outcomes. And I know you said you didn't want to go into AI and I won't, I'll just mention it. Oh, that's fine. Um, what's, really, what's really interesting is as you map these new, um, as you, as these, they're not new chemicals, they've always been there, but as you map what actually exists in food using tools that used to be used for DNA mapping or, or microbiome mapping and are now being turned out on the world that, around us, and you, there, uh, there are companies, Brightseed included, that are taking that information and immediately feeding it through AI and machine learning tools that help them map the outcomes to, to human health and then are immediately turning around into human health trials. Furthermore, they're looking at taking that and tying it to agricultural practices. So does an organic system or a regenerative system or soil centric practices give us a different nutritional outcome? You know, and are we now able to track that? There are those that are hypothesizing that we know less than 1% of what's in our food because the USDA tracks 150 um, uh, uh, um, nutritional uh, components and there's actually 26,000. So, you know, there's this whole huge a uh, ball of wax is about to be uh, hatched as it relates to food as medicine. And we're at a bridge moment in the food system where the side panel static information about food and what it means for your personal nutrition is about to be completely unmasked through wearables, um, being able to scan things with your cell phones and more. And I'll turn it back to the panel or perhaps Christine would like to talk about what Pepsi is doing on oats on that front. Yeah, and, some, and somebody, one of the other uh, questions that we got to just mentioned blockchain. Uh, technology and kind of sharing of information uh, and kind of all the, the, the aspects that that opens up. Uh, so no, AI, all this stuff is, it's, it's really fascinating and, and also that how it's moving uh, things. So yeah, Mike, you're nodding your head or Christine, if you wanted to jump in again. Anybody Go else? ahead, Mike. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. I was saying from, from our side, um, in terms of consumers, when, when it comes to monitoring things, the reality is they will put the onus on the business rather than themselves. I think very few consumers will actively monitor their own carbon footprint emission, for example. They, they probably won't know how they'll take zero interest. But as you said, I think what's really important is this third party validation now. You know, consumers um, are skeptical towards brands. Uh, they think that they can make misleading claims on this kind of scientific led evidence from third party endorsement is something that massively um, appeals to consumers. And we, we ran some research a couple of years ago on the issue of blockchain, and it showed that it was a really, you know, potentially very powerful um, product. Only around, I think it was around 15 or 16% of people had heard of blockchain, and of them, most were more likely to associate it with the financial industry rather than consumer packaged goods. But when they were given a very, like, kind of brief definition around it, Actually, around like 50% of consumers said that they would be willing to use it. And they said that they, they wouldn't use it for every product simply because they don't have time to go and access this information. But they, they would use it in product categories that kind of um, there's been contentious issues, at least in the past, with um, environmental practices such as the coffee market, the bottled water market. Those were two areas where people were particularly responsible for it. Um, but what they wanted was information along the whole of the supply chain. And I think uh, blockchain can be a particularly powerful product, um, both in terms of communicating this information, eliminating any bias, um, offering that information to consumers so that they can readily um, access it. But actually, it can benefit brands in different ways as well. You know, and one of the things that I mentioned was, um, you know, consumers, not all the time they'll purchase a product simply because it's environmentally friendly, you know. There's very few consumers who are genuine, genuine altruistic. They want other benefits as well, which is why, you know, sustainability needs to be placed in context. And if you look at the beer industry, uh, particularly in the UK, or, uh, but to the US as well over the last five, 10 years, it's completely repositioned itself. Um, and it's moved away from that kind of very traditional advertising based around sport, targeting at young males, to instead focusing on corporate and social responsibility. And as an example of being able to do that, they've completely been able to reinvigorate uh, brands, 
but then the category in itself are made premium. And there's a, there's a great example that I saw of um, Budweiser that had been using blockchain technology to highlight awareness of its ethical and environmental practices um, in Africa. And I thought that was really, really positive. You know, like in, in the UK, we see Budweiser as it's, it's the beer touted as the king of sports. It's very much associated with Super Bowl. And to make this dramatic switch away and be focusing on supply chain initiatives um, in sub-Saharan Africa, I thought was really, really powerful. And I think things like blockchain will become increasingly important to offer consumers that information so that they can make those validations. But I think it's, you know, the industry needs to look at it as an opportunity. It's not just something about covering themselves, so to speak. It's about not avoiding any negative press. Actually, if you use that, you can completely reinvigorate your brand and uh, your category as well as a result of that. Um, yep. So, Raj, I want to just, you know, because we have a lot of students out there and, and I think I'd like to bridge a bit and just give a fact and, and then go into what we've been talking about utilizing technology. So the average age of a farmer globally is 60, six, zero. And so we have got to have that next generation of students um, coming into agriculture and the idea that you don't have to be just straight production agriculture, STEM disciplines, being able to use technology. Tina talked about the oat genome where we partnered with, you know, molecular biologists and then put that genome out there open source. The idea that we need every one of the disciplines in agriculture as we go forward is absolutely critical. And so you may think I'm a computer science major, bring it, come on, we need that. You're a finance major, bring it. You're molecular biology, bring it. So I would encourage all the students to have their lens, their aperture open wide when you're thinking about going in uh, to a career and agriculture is really cool. So you should do it. So I'll turn it back to you, Roger. Yeah, it's at the cutting edge of things and kind of all these discussions. I mean, you know, consumer trends and consumer behavior, it all, you know, has to do with it. And again, the great, a great call out and call to action, whatever your skill set is on any of these things, you know, bring it to us. Anybody who's studying, you know, psychology or sociology or ethics, I mean, all these discussions, theology, this is also important to this, that how are, the, how are all these new things, uh, uh, you know, brought into and accepted by communities? And kind of on that point, we have a, a, a question from a point raised by Sarah Herbst, and she's saying, look, Black, Indigenous, people of color, so BIPOC, farmers, advocates uh, have been implementing a lot of these agriculture practices that, that we've been talking about. Uh, for centuries, uh, regenerative agriculture, I think. Uh, Tina, Christine, you had mentioned, yeah, you know, they're dusting off practices that their grandparents or, or you know, further ancestors had used. So how do you kind of validate what, you know, your actions while being respectful of all this traditional ecological, you know, knowledge and behavior that's existed with kind of this new scientific uh, ecological knowledge so that you don't get, you know, uh, uh, accused or seen as, you know, kind of a cultural theft or a, just appropriation of, of kind of this, this, this cultural uh, practices, uh, again, that stretches back uh, for, for a long, long time. So Kevin, I don't know, Kevin, Tina, Christine, anybody who's kind of on the front edge of, of encountering this? I've actually not encountered that specific question, but it is certainly a fascinating question. We, one of the things we're, we try to be really careful about, uh, for example, I, I talked earlier about land stewardship and some things we're doing in that area. We don't want to tell farmers how to farm. So when it comes to practice change, we're agnostic to which practice somebody wants to choose, but we certainly respect the history of agriculture and some of the inventive and creative things that were discovered a long, long time ago. So certainly it's a great question, but I've not ever seen this uh, brought to a forum where it was debated and or where somebody actually was was making a claim that, you know, modern scientific discoveries are 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 for somehow taking away from something in history, but it's fascinating. I've, I've not actually seen that before. Right, 
But I think as they're also talking about, you know, an acknowledgement of that, yeah, these are practices, as you guys have mentioned, that, you know, have been deployed, but kind of in modern agriculture and as things have evolved and changed, that's kind of been sidelined, but now we're returning to uh, yeah. a lot of that because we see the benefits uh, of it. And so I think that was, you know, is, is, is a really good point to make uh, that there is a lot of indigenous, uh, you know, knowledge uh, that's, that's- I would that. call it wisdom, Roger. Actually, wisdom. there's a lot of indigenous wisdom, sure. yes. And so um, this is a very hot and heavy conversation and the beating heart in the, in the center of the regenerative ag community, especially when you have, um, you know, a very famous movie on Netflix that was uh, all the rage over the last six months, uh, you know, nine months or so, um, you know, that got called out for this very thing. You know, are, are we uh, as white people taking the um, practices that have been held as sacred by specific communities um, and, and adopting them now and calling them our own is a, is a key question. But also, yeah. you know, you look at the state of black farmers in the U.S., and this has been a, a big uh, conversation in front of uh, Secretary Vilsack and the current USDA, um, less than one million black farmers exist within the U.S., and that number has fallen significantly over the last 50 years because of the way that U.S. policy has helped with the exclusion of farmers from being at that table, um, farmers of color. And, and um, what you're seeing now is a lot of people trying to work to play catch up very quickly to ensure that not only are those farmers given equal or even more uh, measure uh, in uh, representation at the table, but also, um, you know, how are we uh, inviting them in to help lead us in this moment with that indigenous wisdom that, frankly, we all need because that finger on the pulse of the climate, what's happening to the planet. And you may notice I perked up a little bit with the passion in my voice. This is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. I'm raising grazed animals in my backyard. You know, yeah. we're looking to indigenous wisdom on how to act on our own farm. And so I just want to make sure that we do acknowledge the fact that much of what we are considering to be new is actually old and now you know we're rediscovering it as white people and in some ways claiming it as our own and, and people have a problem with us trying to claim that as being ours solely and it's important that we share um, uh, you know where we're, we're getting those ideas and also making sure that people are coming to the table um, from the BIPOC community to help us lead in this moment and then um, Christine I don't know if you have anything to add and I want to turn it over to you if you do. Yeah, Christine. Yeah, I, I think um, everyone is uh, really bringing up um, great points. And and so for Popsico, you know, we, we've made uh, commitments to empower women and minorities in our agricultural supply chain. And I, I part of part of what we want to do is really have that farmer, that peer-to-peer -peer learning. You've talked, we've we've talked a lot about the farmer and and how he or she can bring, you know, their history, their wisdom, their skill set. And so for PepsiCo, we have a program called Demonstration Farms. And we've got about oh close to 300, 350 around the globe. And what that is is we'll work with what we call them an innovative farmer. And he or she will, you know, open up his or her farm to that surrounding community. PepsiCo comes in, provides some um, education, maybe some finance. We bring input providers, but it's really meant for the farmer to speak to another farmer. We act as a convener because that peer-to-peer, farmer-to-farmer learning is how we're going to flip the system. And so this is something that we all, I think, are leaning into is they're the heroes. They're the superheroes of, you know, agriculture. And so we, we all need to support and help them the best we can. And, and this is how we approach the, the learning from, from the indigenous people or the local farmer down the street. Yeah, thank you, uh, everybody, for chiming in on that. Uh, and yeah, when you think of, of kind of what we have deprived ourselves of as a nation uh, and, our, and, a, and a world by... Uh, uh, you know, kind of moving away uh, from some of these practices. You know, you mentioned uh, uh, the, the tremendous, the great, uh, sad, tragic diminution of the number of black farmers uh, in, in, in the country and kind of, you know, denying ourselves uh, all, you know, the potential, uh, adding to the potential bounty uh, and, 
uh, productivity and productiveness of this of this country on the particularly on the agriculture front. Uh, and so hopefully that is is yeah that you you had mentioned the things that that uh, the Biden administration and Secretary Vilsack uh, say they're going to be prioritizing on this front. So we'll be keeping a close eye on them to make sure that they do indeed do that. Hey, so one final question that comes from a number of people kind of be, before we get into our closing round of, of, of thoughts. Um, you know, uh, hearing this from a number of, I think they're students because some are coming from universities, Virginia Tech, uh, other places uh, that, so one, the incentive to the farmers uh, to do this, the cost of, of kind of these regenerative practices, um, how's that being uh, uh, born? Is it being passed on to consumers? And are we risking uh, that, you know, um, the, 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 the cost of some of these products then is, goes up and becomes kind of more of an elitist uh, thing or some of these products that, that or the, 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 the efforts that we're talking about. Uh, so kind of the, the, the cost, both the incentive for the farmers to adopt these practices and how, if there is an increased cost, uh, how that is being uh, absorbed uh, by the companies or passed on or where does that fit into the, the pricing structure? And then, so in essence, the affordability of all these new products then. So again, anybody who um, wants I'm, to... Uh, yeah, I'm happy to jump in, Roger. Um, so, you know, as my role is to open really big doors for farmer financing that goes hand in hand with what we're spending, um, I think it's important to note that no one company has a large enough checkbook to pay for the conversion of their entire supply chain. Nor should we necessarily have to bear that burden all on our own because there are so many benefits to the local communities, the waterways, to us as society. And so, you know, one of the things we've done is um, novel partnerships with like uh, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, who is, is there as an entity to take public private partnerships and ensure that every dollar that we spend is matched with uh, a dollar from the NRCS for changes on farm. And so, um, wherever possible, we're looking to bear the brunt of the cost ourselves and not pass it on to farmers or consumers, but also use our might and clout as a, a large CPG to be able to pull uh, entities together and open those big doors that farmers themselves may not have been able to open on their own. We're also utilizing impact investing, so low to no cost loans from individuals of high net worth and family foundations that can be bundled and provided in subordination to existing farmer debt that allows farmers to have really flexible capital when they do need it to make these changes. Um, and so, you know, if they do have to take out uh, a loan for a roller crimper, for example, or for solar panels or lagoon covers or, you know, wind energy, that they're able to do so at as low a cost as possible. And then um, bringing to uh, the table those other community members that are interested in seeing the same outcomes in the ecosystems that we are and then bundling that financing together. I'll turn it back to the panelists for other examples. Yeah, I would say, you know, for PubSico, um, we do support some cost share to the farmers. For example, if they want to go and uh, try um, cover crops, you know, so we would do a cost share to help them buy that cover crop seed. And the beauty, as Tina said, is in a particular sourcing region, there may be two to four large companies. So we get together and we say, look, in, in this area, you know, PepsiCo is buying this and company A, you're buying that and company C, you're buying this. How do we get together? Because these practices help that whole landscape or that region. And so we'll get together and cost share with other companies to get those farmers to think about new practices and get them over the financial hump um, that they may encounter by trying the new things. I think um, the issue of affordability um, is a really big thing in a recessionary environment. One, one, of the, one of the things that we said to clients over the last 12 months is, you know, uh, consumers want um, short and supply chains. And they said, oh, it sounds great in theory, but, you know, we might lose out from things such as economies of scale, um, costs will go up. Um, how do we pass that on to the end consumer in um, a recessionary environment? You know, even before the recession um, that's hitting at the moment, you know, consumers found uh, food inflation a genuine issue. Many consumers were struggling with their shopping bills, worried about everyday living costs, you know, um, and, and the big question is, will consumers be willing to pay for, um, you know, an environmentally friendly product if it carries a premium price? Now, I think it's as, 
uh, Tina and Christine have both alluded to, you know, there's, there's ways of dealing with that. Firstly, you can look to combine resources. Secondly, you don't have to address every single element. There's always going to be, you know, products that have certain features, you know, so it's not making, addressing every single thing. It's um, addressing the things that are most important to consumers. But what you tend to get, you know, you, obviously you always get some consumers who will be struggling with everyday living costs and will simply go for the cheapest price products, irrespective of how environmental friendly or how non-sustainable it is. But for actually for a lot of consumers, they will, um, they will, they will adopt in something called high-low consumerism, where they, they look to save money on certain things to encourage trade upon on other things. And if sustainability is something that is genuinely important to them, or actually that sustainability benefit um, links to um, another benefit, it's something that enhances the, the value proposition where you can bring a product and say, okay, it's environmentally friendly, but here are the benefits. Well, actually, the money's benefiting the local community. The money's benefiting the wider environment. That enables the product to be formulated in a certain way. As a result, it tastes better, it's healthier, it's more trustworthy, et cetera, and the money's going back to good co- then actually you you still will get consumers who are willing to trade up. So, so I do understand, you know, context is important. If if a product is triple, quadruple the price of an average product in the market, people aren't going to buy that. And you, you go around a trade convention sometimes and you'll see, you know, some of these products that are brilliantly from a, brilliant from a sustainable pro- perspective. And you think it's just not going to get into the, the retailers just because the, are high, the price is too high. That's just not going to happen. But if you have the right balance between price and the related benefits and you give consumers that additional motivation um i think consumers will still be willing to trade up even in a recessionary environment yep great so thank you for that uh mike and those thoughts and so to all the panelists you can see kind of questions that that have come in uh one from from a great friend and a, a supporter uh of all of us dan silverstein um the uh the question to christine in particular uh, if you see that, because uh, uh, we're coming to the end of our uh, discussion, uh, time is closing in on us. Uh, so uh, Tricia, Maddie, uh, I think we'll have uh, these questions. They can kind of farm them out uh, to you uh, in terms of Dan's, you know, protecting the so smallholder farmers and, uh, uh, you know, financial mechanisms and things. Um, uh, so there are a lot of great questions. So I just want to make sure we had uh, time for a last uh, kind of round uh, of questions. So maybe quickly a minute uh, thought of each. Uh, some of you have already addressed this and talked about it, but any message that you have to the, to the students uh, that are tuning in, kind of any uh, uh, advice or wisdom, kind of things they should be studying now, what are promising career prospects? One particular challenge to them, Christine, you talked about STEM. Uh, and, 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 and Tina, anything else that uh, you want to mention? Uh, so yeah, Christine, let's we'll start with you. Uh, I would say um, don't be afraid to uh, jump off the high board or raise your hand. Um, you know, there's lots of fun things out there and um, take a chance. Uh, I'm sure that it will be successful and you'll be proud that you did. Uh, Tina. I, you're entering the food system and the agriculture system at a time of great disruption and change, which means you get to learn it as it unfolds. Don't be surprised 7, 10, 15 years into your career when it all flips again. And please don't be the stick in the mud that keeps it from moving forward. Everybody's got to work together in this moment to help mitigate climate change. Thank you. Kevin. I would encourage the students that food and ag is a great place to start your career. There are so many opportunities available. It doesn't matter if you're into social sciences or if you're into biochemistry or engineering, or if you're pre-vet or pre-med, you may want to try something for a few years before taking that high board. But I can assure you that there are very rewarding futures for all of you in the ag community. It's a great place to work. Uh, tr a lot of tremendous companies and um, we're making a difference, so come and help us. Thank you. Mike, we started with you with the keynote, your kind of closing thoughts on uh, any words of wisdom to the students. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, well, firstly, you know, best of luck with future careers and, 
you know, agriculture is something to, you know, definitely look at and also wider things related to sustainability. We've seen that the role of sustainability in business is constantly evolving. Um, it's disruptive. It's innovative. Um, it provides a massive opportunity. It needs thought leaders of the next generation to continue to challenge the status quo and, you know, challenge the way that businesses think. And, you know, it's something that's driven by urgency. We see the damage done to the, the environment, but actually it's something that's, you know, can also be aspirational. You know, it can be something that's really exciting, really dynamic and, you know, um, you know, best of luck with the future. And hopefully, um, hopefully there'll be many of you that join this industry and, you um, you know, really enjoy the experience. Thank you. So thanks to everybody on the panel. I will use the, the moderator's prerogative for a final thought. Kevin had mentioned, look, we can all make a difference on this and particularly on this, this, this utter imperative uh, to finally end hunger and malnutrition, wherever it may be in this world. Every single person can make a difference. We can all have a contribution for it. You know, we're not just waiting for certain people in lab coats or, you know, great minds to sort this out. Yes, we need the great minds. We need the people in lab coats. But anybody, again, no matter what you're studying, no matter what your passion is, if you bring it to this issue, you can truly make a difference. Individuals uh, matter. So one of those individuals, Tricia, will hand it back uh, to you to, to wrap up and send us on our way. Thank you. Oh, thank you. What an amazing panel. I want to say thank you to all of our stellar speakers and to you, Roger. It was just an excellent discussion today. And for those of you who asked questions, I noticed some of you also were in the press. We'll circle back and we'll make sure that, you know, we touch base with all the, the panelists who can weigh in on those questions and we will get back with you. So this is um, only the first half of our speaker series for 2021. We'll be picking up again in the fall, um, beginning with the fall semester and you know, having a great second half of this series that flows through that. And I, I did wanna mention that one really important piece of that and something that's really you know, near and dear to the mission in the heart of Farm Journal Foundation is a panel that we'll be having on um, black, indigenous and people of color um, coming up um, in our fall speaker series. So looking at the history, looking at you know, how we can build a bright, inclusive future um, that will be part of the discussion that we have this fall. So please join us then. And thanks to everyone that um, participated today and our sponsors um, who made this possible. Just everyone have a great, safe summer. And we look forward to seeing you in the fall. Thank you.